It was two o'clock in the morning. With my midriff out of the water and a stopwatch in my hand, I lost count of the number of times I measured the length of each contraction and the time which had passed since the one before. I had spent three hours lying in the bath, wondering if the birth was coming soon. Contractions of one minute every three minutes. This must mean that the time had come for my baby to arrive. Nevertheless, I was a little concerned. Why was I having contractions every three minutes when I had been told they would be every five? This should not have surprised me since my pregnancy had been far from normal. Diagnosed with an irritable uterus, I'd had frequent, frequent contractions since the fifth month of my pregnancy. The simple matter of standing and walking a little made my stomach contract, which then became very stiff and uncomfortable. Since I knew I had taken great care and that there was no real fear of a premature birth, I had grown accustomed to this unusual situation. With my skin all wrinkled and my body seizing up, I finally decided to get out of the bath. The pain caused by the contractions was gently intensifying, and I had a clear sense that I should wake my husband and ask his advice. Was it too early to contact my midwife? I was not overly keen on the idea of interrupting her sleep to get her opinion on my situation. Once he was awake and had observed that my contractions were perfectly regular and were getting more and more uncomfortable, my husband felt that we should contact her. I called her a pager and five minutes later, Holly was ringing us back to answer our questions. After hearing a little about my condition, she told us she would be with us shortly. Every sign of labor was there to see. As we waited for Holly to arrive, I helped Gerhard prepare our bed for the birth. When it was ready, I sat down on an exercise ball, which I found rather more comfortable during my contractions, which were becoming even more painful. A few minutes later, Holly arrived all calm and smiling, despite being woken up in the middle of the night. I was reassured to see her because I knew I was in good hands with her. She didn't delay in checking the dilation of my cervix. It was already at four centimeters. On a very encouraging note, she told me that our baby would certainly be arriving into the world this morning. Wow. I had not been expecting it to be so quick. I didn't even notice the dawn as it sipped into our bedroom. The intensity of the pain made me feel as if I was occupying another dimension. A few hours passed, but my cervix only dilated an extra two centimeters. Since my water still hadn't broken, Holly suggested breaking them with a little hook that was designed for the purpose. A spectacular quantity of amniotic fluid emerged. Holly had never seen so much liquid come out of a womb. On closer inspection, she noticed that the color of the liquid was not entirely transparent. She thought it possible, therefore, that there were some traces of meconium, the feces that the baby had started to expel. If this were the case, I would have to go to hospital to finish the birth there, so the baby could be monitored more closely. But since there seemed to be only slight traces, she gave me the choice of continuing the birth at home or going to hospital. No hesitation was necessary. I wanted a home birth. I was going to stay in my bedroom until our child was born. With my water is now broken, the contractions had become even more painful. Holly was confident that it would be effective and that my uterus would dilate the full 10 centimeters quite quickly. I decided to have a bath to make my contractions a little more bearable. 
Gerhard and Holly took turns keeping me company. I don't remember much of the experience. Only that I was now just living for those moments of respite in between, in between each contraction. The morning passed and my cervix was refusing to dilate any further. I started crying from the pain and I vomited the little breakfast that I had managed to swallow a few hours beforehand. Seeing me in such a state, Gerhard cried a few tears of compassion as he tried his best to support me through my suffering. After exima exima examining my uterus once again, Holly noticed that it hadn't dilated beyond six centimeters and suggested we go to hospital to continue the birth. That way, I could receive an epidural and relax a, lint a little until my cervix was ready for labor. I was so determined to give birth at home that I refused and decided instead to continue in spite of the immense pain, pain hoping that my willpower would be rewarded. Holly decided to contact another midwife, Marzi, and ask her advice. She chose to come in person to offer her, her assistance. While Gerhard was resting in the living room and Holly was taking a break for a short nap in the guest room, Marzi stepped in to replace them. I went back for a bath while she was with me. Sitting beside the bathtub, her calm composure was comforting for me. My contractions were so powerful that I started grabbing hold of her legs and then hitting them with the palms of my hands to get through the furious waves of pain. After a while, she suggested getting out of the bath to try some other methods to help with the dilation. I felt I was almost in a trance. I don't even remember her suggesting that I should get dressed or me completely refusing to do so. With Gareth's help, we tried the techniques she suggested, but in vain. Our efforts were getting nowhere. Once Holly had returned from her nap, she and Marzi tried once again to convince me to go to hospital. My reserve or energy were fading, and it told me how important it was to save my strength for the big push. What's more, at hospital, they could monitor the baby's condition more closely. Despite my reluctance and my great disappointment, I agreed to get dressed and go. It was already three o'clock in the afternoon. The car journey to hospital was arduous. I had my eyes closed and gripped the door handle and my seat to get through each spasm of pain. Little gasps of suffering sometimes escaped my lips. Even though I was upset not to be completing the labor nat naturally without anesthetic, I was starting to feel relieved at the thought of the epidural which was waiting for me. When we arrived at the hospital, we were quickly shown to a room. Our two midwives came to join us straight away. The anesthetist was there without delay, and I received a promised epidural. Once the pain had passed, I took the chance to call my parents to warn them that I was in labor and that I had gone to hospital following some complications. I reassured my mother that I was fine and that I would call her when our baby was born. Marzi then advised me to try to get some sleep. I did my best, but couldn't really manage it. I did my very best to relax. I could see Gerhard sleeping in a corner of the room on a chair that was far from comfortable. I could hear regular sounds from the machine monitoring my baby's heartbeats, which kept me alert. Gerhard offered me some iced tea to quench my thirst and reunited re-energize me a little. Then Marzi noticed that my contractions had lessened. This is a common effect of the epidural. She added some oxytocin to my drip to stimulate the contractions of my uterus. 
It was yet another medical intervention that I had not hoped for. But I really had to accept it after 18 hours of labor. I had to wait until 9 o'clock in the evening for my cervix to dilate to 10 centimeters and for it to be ready for the ordeal of pushing the baby through. And what an ordeal it was. Four long hours of pushing. After around three hours of fruitless labor, an obstetrician came to examine me. She told the midwives that she thought there were only a few more pushes left until the baby arrived. But, th but this wasn't the case. I was starting to despair. It was at this moment that Marzi started to talk to me about the possibility of a caesarean. At this suggestion, I started to cry. That was really not what I wanted. The exact opposite of what I had imagined as my ideal birth. Between sobs, I started to say that if my baby wasn't coming, it must surely be my fault. Perhaps somewhere deep inside me, I didn't really want this child and these feelings were preventing the birth. At these words, Marzi tried straight away to reassure and encourage me. These thoughts were false and I should not blame myself. They had been trying everything possible to move my labor along and I was showing incredible strength and resolve. If surgical interventions were necessary, it was for the good of my baby and myself. Gerhard helped me to accept this possibility. When the obstetrician returned, she told me that she was going to try to help the baby out with the ventus. She was going to allow me two more contractions. If that still didn't work, a caesarean would be the only option left. The operating room was already prepared for this eventuality.